Okay. So the idea is the talk is an hour and then there are 15 right. minutes yeah. of uh, it's question good. building. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, you know, 10 or 15 minutes or whatever for questions and yes, answer that. Okay, good. good. So one thing I don't think that uh, my, uh, the way I usually look at this is that I've got my time on my computer, so I just start when it's there, but now with your screen share, I can't see, so I have to keep on looking over to my other computer to see that it's time to start. Okay. And I've been told that when I turn my head to look at my other computer, you can't hear me. Oh, okay. But if anything else, I can deal with this. This is a this is a problem that is solved easily. Okay, so I'd like to welcome everybody to the Western Hemisphere Colloquium for Geometry and Physics. Uh, this is going to be a one hour talk, uh, followed by 15 minutes for Q&A. But during the talk, uh, feel free to just unmute yourself and ask questions. The speaker will be uh, happy to answer. And without further ado, let me introduce Ibu Ba, who will talk to us on non suzy solitons and gravity. Okay. Thank you, Sheldon, for the introduction. Okay, so I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me in this uh, really nice uh, seminar series, uh, which is one of the things that keep many of us alive <laughs> in, these, in these times. Um, so, so, so the topic that I will discuss is just recent interest uh, that I've had over, over, over the pandemic. It's a little, a little further from the usual topics that I study in supersymmetric QFT and relating to geometry and so forth. But I hope uh, you enjoy uh, uh, the talk. So first, let's see, does this work? Good, so let's start with some motivation. So I have two broad motivations of why I would want to think about this. Uh, oh, before I start, I should mention this work was done in collaboration with a really, really excellent postdoc at Hopkins, uh, Pierre Heidman, who will be here with us for a couple more years. So some, some broad motivation. So recently, the last, five years, we've observed gravitational waves, which is, of course, incredibly exciting for, for many people in astrophysics. But I would say it's even more exciting for us in, in, in who do formal studies, who study string theory and gravity in general. And in part, this is because within the next decade, there will be a very robust field of gravitational spectroscopy where people will be able to study and detect ultra compact objects, which for at first sign all look like black holes, but pretty soon when they are not black holes, we will know what they are. We will know that they are not black holes. So this raises a rather interesting question that, that I think we should answer, which is broadly, what is the spectrum of ultra compact objects that you might expect in theories of gravity from string theory, the subject that many of us work on. Another motivation is, um, in, within string theory, there is a very robust program that studies microstate geometry, which, is, uh, which are smooth horizonless solutions, which are understood to describe coherent states of, 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 of microstates for black holes themselves. So this is work done Mature and Bena and Warner over, over the years. But in, these, but in these studies and constructions, the typical things people look at are very supersymmetric and certainly very BPS. And another question you could ask is, can such a coherent state of quantum gravity exist very far from a non-BPS regime as solutions of classical theories of gravity, right? So these are these two broad things that I think one ought to be able to answer within the next few years or so. 
So first, um, <clears throat> what do we mean when we say we want solid constant gravity? So we want to be able to have a framework, whatever that is, that allow us to construct solitons, and these should be asymptotically flat, smooth solutions, which have no horizons. They have to have some finite energy configuration and have some definitely well-defined charges. And importantly, they need to exist by exist, meaning they're classically stable. And they also, they correspond to metastable saddles of, gravita of the gravitational Euclidean action. We do not need to expect something that is stable because if you far from Susie, it's expected that you will decay, but you can hope for it at least some, to have some metastable object that you can study uh, in, 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 in some way. Okay, so that's a more interesting question. I may have time to make a couple of comments later, but probably will not. So what happens when you want to think about the problem? As we know, without supersymmetry, already Einstein's equations are very nonlinear PDEs, so good luck, right? So the, the, the statement is in gravity, if you don't know what you're looking for, you should probably not try. Right. So, so this, this statement is even worse uh, from the point of view of the questions that we ask, which is that if we want to think about uh, solitons, right? So Einstein's equations are very much nonlinear. People understood nonlinear equations have soliton solutions. So actually very early on, um, starting with Serini, 1918, uh, later with Einstein, Pauli, Richard Norovitz in the 40s, it was very fast established that if you have an asymptotically flat 4D solution, which is topologically trivial, which is globally stationary, then it is completely flat, right? So this is, a, this is, this is the famous no soliton theorems and there are various extensions and generalizations that you might ask. So here you could raise the question about black holes, but of course black holes, they're not globally stationary because the time-like killing vector shrinks at the horizon, okay? So, so, so that's, that's the sort of a loophole. You can think about, let's say, wormhole geometry, right? But then if you consider wormhole geometry in 4D, usually those can be extended further into space where you will find some singularity somewhere else. Okay, so it's quite hard to, to go around this, this these no go theorems in four dimensions. However, this, of course, when you have a no go theorem, it just sort of points a direction of what you should change and what you should look at. So this sort of a question was recently sort of thought about by Gibbons and Warner by revisiting these questions. And this, they wanted to think about this in the context of why supersymmetric and BPS uh, microstate geometries exist from the point of view of GR and from the point of view of the null soliton theorem. They found there are several interesting ways you could, of course, uh, evade this. If your space-time have some interesting topology, that's one way to do it. And if you have interesting topology, usually you want to be able to support it with, some, with something, So you need to have various Maxwell-type fields, two-form, three-form, higher-form fields to be able to support such a topological structure. If your theory of gravity have interesting turn Simon's terms and various other topological interactions, you could also evade these theorems. And more importantly, in all of these cases, in order to really evade them, you have to go beyond the four-dimensional space-time in that you have to add extra dimensions. And all of these are ingredients that we're all, all used to playing with in the context of string theory and in, and, and in super gravity. So you can even ask these questions then just from pure theories of gravity with added, added features. And this is a question we want to think about today. So the strategy is, Okay, so we're shown various ways we could sort of avoid these no-go theorems. Then what we will want to look for, we will consider some Minkowski background with a bunch of circles, okay? And we want to ask if we take such a background and turn on some various types of fluxes, could you construct something good and meaningful? So intuitively what you should have in mind is the thing that I call a topological star, if you want to find solutions where you have extra dimensions collapse in rather interesting way to give you interesting topology in the external four dimensional space line. So can you have this? If you can make any, can you make them smooth, regular, well-behaved uh, uh, far away? 
So broadly, we refer to these types of objects if they exist as topological stars. Okay. So this was the broad sort of introduction. Any questions so far? Please feel free to ask if any. Okay, good. So what you want to do, if you want to do such a question, but if you want to do anything with Einstein's equation, you have to figure out a way to start slow and sort of ramp up and get some inst instinct of how things work. So we will start with a, we will consider vial system. So these are static, so no rotation and actually symmetric space times configuration. So we give up spherical symmetry, but we try to be static at least, and ask, can we build something within this framework? Or can we at least understand if you cannot build something, why are things failing? Okay, so let's, let's, let's start study the problem from the ground up. So as a brief review, what we mean by a vial system, so in four dimensions, famously, this corresponds to having a timepiece, which is static, and then you have some 3D base, which is actually symmetric. So Z here is the axial, so Z is the, is the axis of rotation, and then you have rho as moving away from this, okay? And we, could, we want to think about space-times that have some magnetic field turned on. So we have a two-form flux, which, which, which we do not allow electric fields, we just consider magnetic fields for the sake of uh, this discussion here. Good, so one of the nice things that happens when you consider vial systems um, is there is some reasonable control of Einstein's equation, which is that it sort of splits into two sectors at, already at this level. The first sector I will refer to as Maxwell's in the Maxwell sector. It involves the gauge field that you want to turn on here. And it also involves this warp factor that's appearing over here. Okay, so there is, a, there, is, there, is a, there is already a pair of nonlinear equations. You can see that these equations a priori are fairly nonlinear, but it, 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 it governs one sector of Einstein's equations. The other sector involves understanding the metric on the base, which is going to be determined by this warp factor, which I will call new. One of the nice things that happens even already Right. What is little c? Ah, good. Little c is some constant. It's a constant. That's an integration constant. You've integrated? no, no, no. It's a, it's a, it's a gravitational coupling because this is Einstein. This is a, this is the Einstein tensor in here, and over here is the, is the, is the stress tensor of the, of the, of the field. So c is one over g newton squared. One over g newton. That's one over g. Newton with some decoration of some numbers. So I, I just wanted to avoid that. Look, I haven't integrated anything. I've just written down Einstein's equation. Good, uh, thanks for the question. So the interesting that happens here is that, uh, so with this sort of cleanup or organization of the Einstein's equation, you observe that the metric on the base is governed by this, uh, by nu, and, and the equations for nu are first order, you can, inter they're first order, and they're given in terms of functions of, 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 uh, of, 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 of the, of, of h and z, and also it's, it's derivative. Okay, so you can decompose Einstein's equations in this way. And interestingly enough is, these equations, so it's a pair of them, so they have to have some integrability constraint. And the integrability constraint is completely implied by the previous sector, the Maxwell sector. Okay, so a strategy for studying vial system is to uh, think about how to solve what I will refer to as reduced Einstein's equations. Okay, and then if you construct any solutions for that, then you're guaranteed to construct a solution for new and therefore the metric on the base, okay? So we will not think about this new much, but the point is, is that just at the, at the uh, just by imposing the vial symmetry, you have this rather nice decomposition. Of course, you should, uh, you should be say, well, it's a highly nonlinear PDEs. Why, what am I so excited about? 
but it's, it's a start. Let's see where, where, where we can go with it, okay? So you can ask, can you generalize the system without adding more complexity at least, right? So we know we have to have extra dimensions. So if you think about extra dimensions, can we generalize without adding more complications to, to, to our lives? So first, there are two interesting generalizations worth considering. One, you can take your 3D base and extend it to a 4D base by adding a circle with some connection, okay? Another thing you can do also, you can add n number of extra circles, which just go with the time direction in some way. So this is going to be n number of isometry directions that you add to, to, to your system. And when you do this, because you've made the base four dimensional instead of a three dimensional, the, you can, you have, you're forced to consider by force, I will, I'll say in a minute why I mean by force, you're forced to consider a three form flux instead of a two form flux, meaning the, the F3 has also a leg along the, the extra circle in the base that you've added. So why is this nice? This is nice because when you then push through Einstein's equation, you, you, you observe that you haven't made your life harder compared to the 4D vial system. You haven't made your life harder, except you just sort of replicated the, the, the same equation again. You observe that the, 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 the base that, you, that you've added Z0 with the Maxwell field, they will satisfy this reduced Einstein's equation, okay? Similarly, the warp factor that you have here uh, with respect to the n, n circles that you've added, coupled with the Maxwell field for the three form flux, also satisfy the reduced Einstein's equation. So you've just replicated the same problem. You, you, you didn't make it harder. And all of the internal potentials here that determine the sizes of the circles uh, and also the size of the time circle. So I'll refer to T as a time circle. So if you don't be too offended, but I will refer to it as a time circle. All of these functions also decouple from the other warp factors and they just satisfy a Laplace equation. Okay, so this is nice. Uh, life hasn't gotten harder and still the base metric is completely determined once you understand the fiber, this, when you get a solution of the fiber direction. If you, under, if you get a solution of all of the warp factors that govern the fiber directions, then the base metric is solved completely. So in our work, we sort of made this observation, but I should mention that when we turn off all of the fluxes, H0 and H1 to zero, this is just a vacuum system. And such a vacuum vial system had been studied by Amparan and Rayal, and a lot of the interesting work on, on understanding black holes and the space of black holes in high dimensions in the early 2000s sort of was born out of this approach, okay? But in this story, we want to think about charges because we know we have to have charges in order to be able to support any sort of interesting topological structure that we want to build. Okay. So for the rest of the talk, I will, I will restrict. So I've described here sort of a, a fairly general setup for where people can go ahead and play. So I will restrict now to a case where I just have two circles added. I have the base, uh, base space time extended to four instead of three. And then I've added an extra circle outside, which I refer to Y1. For sake of the clarity of various kinds and also to make the notation simpler, um, the, the base circle is referred to Y2, not Y0 as in the previous slide. So I, so I hope that's fine. Um, good, so now the solutions that you want, so we know the equation that we have to solve, what do the solution, what must the solutions do? So we want to be able to shrink the, the extra circles without uh, creating a horizon, right? So the Y2 circle have to, will shrink when Z2 goes to, goes to infinity while also keeping Z1 finite. Whereas the Y1 circle will, will shrink when this combination goes to infinity while this ratio stays finite. 
In all of these cases, we want to have no horizons. So we want to keep this combination of, 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 of warp factors to be greater than zero. So this sets your boundary conditions of what you want, and you want to have these boundary conditions with the, the reduced Einstein's equations for these pair of fields and also for the vacuum function W. Okay, uh, any questions now? Okay, good. So let's get on to building stuff. Okay, first, before we build, let the, um, since I've turned on, since I've considered 4D vial system with a, with, with a Maxwell field uh, and a magnetic field, famously, everyone knows that there are the BPF solutions, which corresponds to multi-center black holes in four dimensions. So, uh, so such a solution has to be a solution of, 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 of this reduced Einstein's equation. And it is instructive to understand how that works because it will allow us to figure out how to move forward. So if we consider the reduced Einstein's equations here, um, uh, which I copied, so the kappa here, as Greg asked earlier, is just going to be the gravitational coupling of the system. Because I'm in five dimensions, six dimensions, the, the powers and the warp factors slightly change, but that's not a big deal. It's the same uh, uh, type of an equation that you can study. Good. So, wh so what is, what, where do BPF solutions sit from the point of view of these reduced Einstein's equation? Consider the pair of functions X and Y, where X is a harmonic potential in the 3D base. So X will satisfy a Laplace's equation of this form. Y is dual to X in some sense, and Y satisfies the similar equations, but not quite the harmonic equation, okay? So the gradients of X and Y uh, are orthogonal and their norms are, are, are the same. Um, with these assumptions, you can show, actually you could see just from those assumptions that if you take H, which is a, uh, the gauge field to be Y, and then you can take Z, the potential to be just X, right? So then the potential is the harmonic potential, and this is the harmonic potential that we know that governs the multi-center black holes. But in this case, it's a, it's a, it's, 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 it's because we've, we've, we've imposed axial symmetry, this is a chain of black holes along, along, along the axis. So, so you might ask then, ah, this is nice, could I use this solution to then go to higher dimensions and try to construct uh, what I want to construct. And as soon as you start, you run into a trouble, but which, which, which will have an interesting solution. First, um, if we consider this, the, 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 the 6D setup that I want to consider, right? And I want to take this Z1, this potential, which as we just described in the BPS solutions, will satisfy a Laplace's equation. However, in the same setup, the W potential, which governs the size of the circle, its log satisfies the Laplace's equation. And the BPS system that we're familiar with, the sources for the potential Z are point particles, right? That, are, that you would align, that you would put along the line. They're, 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 they're point particles. Whereas the sources that can lead to good solutions for, for log W are actually going to be uh, line segments. They're going to be line sources. So, so what this means then, if you consider the solution that you would get from a line source for W and the solution that you would get from a point source for Z and you combine them very fast, you would see that you cannot construct a solution that satisfies the boundary condition that you want and you get just something that is singular. Okay, so immediately, you see that BPS-like object, uh, BPS-like solutions that you would that, that you would want to try to import that do not do not quite work simply because of how Einstein's equations in this non-BPS limit uh, 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 behave. So the statement is that is that of course if I turn on turn off all the fluxes, uh, I no longer have the BPS solution. Then I go back to the vacuum, and that's. And, and everything is fine, and that's been that's, that's been studied 
uh, quite a bit, and I will allude to it later. Although not for topological structures, for black holes. So, however, using making a note of that, here is an observation that that I will offer, which is that if you instead uh, do this piecewise, you impose that H is Y, where Y is this function that we described. But now we consider that our potential Z is just some general function of the harmonic potential X, okay? So we want to say, can we embed this, any linear structure of this kind here that we can then try to play with and construct anything interesting? Interestingly enough, this was surprising to see uh, that if you consider some general function f of x, and because of the way these, the x and y functions work, when you plug it into this fairly nonlinear equation, you find that there are four other solutions in addition to the BPS that, that, that are just sitting there, right? There is one solution where you have a cinch where here a and b are, 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 are general parameters, okay? So if you're doing broad sort of parameter counting, Already, you can observe that you're 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 doing something going beyond the BPS limit, but instead being able to build something which has a linear structure. In that, if we go back to the BPS solution uh, here, we had x, and then we had a general constant of of integration here. If we go to this new family of solutions you can see you always have two parameters appearing, right? There are two parameters. So there's an extra parameter where if you then try to take, for example, A to, 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 to zero in this BPS limit, then you would recover back in this solution here, in the cinch solution, for example, if you take A to zero, then you would recover back the solution F is X plus a constant, which would be the BPS thing. So there is a, there is, a no, there is a notion of having a BPS limit embedded into this, this, this system of solution. But now the system of solution I, would, I, will, I will demonstrate now are more interesting and they actually allow you to build some of the stuff that we want to build. And for the rest of this talk, I will actually use only this function. These other functions are interesting. Uh, some of them, we have some sense what they do. The others, cosines and cinch are, Still mysterious what else they do for us, okay? But for the rest of the talk, I will use this solution for the reduced Einstein's equation and see what we can get from there. In fact, I will demonstrate that, well, it wouldn't be interesting if I couldn't do anything with it, okay? Uh, any questions here? Should I, I should... Yeah, I have a question. These so, are not BPS, right? These are not BPS. So but, should, should there be but, an instability? Good, there is a question of instability, which uh, asked me at the end of the talk. The, what, so the, what you would hope for, what you could hope for is maybe there, if you could build anything that maybe they're metastable, okay? They, they're not going to be fully stable, but maybe they could be metastable. Good. Okay, so let's, let's see what we can build with this solution. Um, okay, so we, so we review the metric again. And as, as we mentioned before, the sources that you can, that, that, that you can build at least with the W functions, which is really the big issue we wanted to cure, is that um, we need to have rod sources for the Laplacian. So, so, so the, the rod sources you can characterize if you, so we can imagine putting a chain of rods along the Z axis. And on each rod, I can, I can associate to it a function xi, which solves the Laplace equation. And xi is going to diverge along the rod. Then with that, we can then construct a solution where we take our z's, which, which have index i here, the index i labels either two or one in, these, in, in, in the space time. And we use the cinch solution. So, so Z is going to be some product of these X's where these X's solve the Laplace equation along each rod. Similarly, we can take our W to be products of X's and then you can construct the, 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 the Maxwell field 
by just taking actually a difference of t's r pluses and r minuses. I do not bother to write what x i look like. They're 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 horrible functions, but but so the solutions you can clearly write down on paper. Okay, so when you write this system now, there are various parameters that you've turned on. There is the g i which appear with the potential w. There are these p i. So since these p i appear with the magnet with the Maxwell field, so these p i actually corresponds to turning on some magnetic flux along the rod. So you're associating some flux, some magnetic flux along the rod. Uh, because the H goes with the Z, so it's the same function, this is the same constant that appears on, on, on top. So the magnetic fields appear here. So now the claim is that this is going to allow me to make smooth stuff. First, we observe that if I don't want to have a horizon, I don't want to have the time circle to collapse in any way. So what this means then, if we zoom on any rod, right, where xi is diverging, then, then this, this function is going to be dominated by the positive powers. Okay, it's going to be dominated by the positive powers. And what this will do is it, it's going to relate the coefficient ai times p with g. Okay, so this you can use to fix one family of, 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 of constants, which one family of weights that appear in the function uh, uh, W. So doing so is going to remove a horizon at every place along this rod that you might get. But now the combination V times W in front of Y1 is free to go and, and go to zero uh, 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 and then co collapse this F1 circle uh, uh, along along the rod. Okay, so this is now the strategy. We, we've we've taken this function, this, this this solution. We can explicitly construct these functions, these and Ws, in terms of these these potentials x i, which are at every rod, and then we can write this down, and then we can go ahead and then go step by step, try to remove all the horizons and study the regularity of this of this system. Okay. Any questions? Okay, good. <clears throat> so what do you get when you try to go and systematically study what happens at a rod? You can characterize the following thing. First, you want your space-time to be asymptotically flat. So what that does, it fixes some family of parameters. So these AIs, which appeared, get fixed with the bees in a very specific way. And this guarantees the space time is asymptotically flat, which is something that we want to have. Then you can have three families of rod sources. You can have what we call a black rod source, which would correspond to a horizon. For that, you end up picking P to be of a specific form and G's on that rod of a specific form. You can also have what you consider a bubble one where you have the Y circle where you have the Y circle collapse. So this is going to be a specific choice of these weights. And then you have a bubble two where the fiber circle in the base itself collapses. There you can see you also have some weight. So one observation is that if you look at the fiber circle, you only have the magnetic field of the connection of its connection turned on. But if you look at the bubble one type, the bubble one where you have the external S1 circle shrink, then you find that you actually have a magnetic field both for the fiber turned on and also for the external uh, flux turned on. Another important point to make here is that now when we solve this here, you can look at the solution that we have is on the over here is independent of the label I. So if you have a rod. A, a rod that either corresponds to a bubble one, a bubble two, or, or, or a horizon, they all look the same. They all look the same in a sense that there is a unit of magnetic field that gets assigned to the rod, right? So every rod is a basic degree of freedom of this construction, and each rod has some unit of magnetic field that is assigned to it. And from that unit of magnetic field, it completely determines 
how it enters into the metric and into the signal. Okay, any questions? Okay, good. So let's see what we can do from here. So to give a more cartoonish picture of what, what is happening here, we can, we can demonstrate it in this way. So here I have three successive uh, rods. I have a rod here, which is a horizon rod. I have a rod, which is a species one bubble. And I have another rod, which is a species two bubble. And in each one of these re regions, you can, you can completely determine what the topology looks like. So here I denote in cartoons, what is the phi circle of the base space time is doing, the phi circle of the base space time. What happens is away from the rod sources, this is just the rho equal to zero axis. So the phi circle basically has zero size. It's just the origin of the cylindrical coordinate. But then when you come to these rod sources, the size of the phi circle actually opens up and it opens up to some interesting topological structure that is sitting on this, on this 3D base space, okay? And this topological structure from the point of view of the 3D external space time is characterized by having either Y1 circle collapse in some region or Y2 circle collapse in another region. So here I've included also a cap a cap here would correspond to a horizon. So in this setup, in the three D base space, it would it would have a it, it would have a horizon, and then there is some non-trivial cycle sitting right attached to the horizon in a different species of a cycle uh, attached to the to 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 that one below. And then we can construct the topology and study what they look like completely. Okay, so this is a just a description of the three types of objects that appear in this, in this construction. Now, what we would want to do is the following to, 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 to achieve our goal, is you can take a succession of species one rods with species two rods, and you can take as long of a, of a, of a configuration as you want. You can take as long of a configuration as you want. And from the 3D base, you, when you approach the region where the rod sources are, you get a big fat uh, uh, region that opens up with, which has some interesting topology from the point of view of the 3D space time. And this big fat region is, 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 is characterized by a succession of the Y1 circle in the Y2 circle collapsing alternatively all the way through this whole thing. Okay, so the geometry that you would construct from getting this long chain of magnetic rods are going to be free from any curvature singularities. And as, as I just described, because I have complete control on what's happening in these rods, also free from horizons that I would want. Okay, and this is a basic unit for our, our construction. Okay. I can stop here and take questions. Are these topologies um, known in other contexts or do they go by any other names? The, I mean, in what sense you mean? So, so if I look at the, the, the space, I can characterize completely what's going on. For example, if I look at the region between two rods, I have the same S1 shrink here and shrink there. So there is an S2, a fat S2 that's sitting there. And then you have the external a uh, 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 time circle, which is there. And, and, that's, and that's just going to be what it is. I'm not sure I have character, I can say any more beyond, beyond, beyond that. It's just the geometry and it has this topology. Maybe I could ask Tudor's question in a slightly different way. So um, maybe you could tell us something about the, uh, the, um, the cohomology groups, the homology groups, or the cohomology groups of this 10 dimensional space time. So I haven't, this, 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 well, this is a six dimensional space and it's non-compact, right? So I haven't- This I haven't, is six, but okay. It's just gonna be crossed for the four. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, a six dimensional space. I mean, what, what's the, what's the homology? I, I haven't computed the homology explicitly to tell you what it looks like. Okay, this is, this is space, let me start simpler. The space is compact or non-compact? 
it's non-compact because I have external four dimensional space. Right. And that's where all of the action is coming from. So from the point it, of view of the it, it contracts onto a non-trivial CW complex, right? Yeah, something like this. Yeah. So from the point of view, the, the point of view taken is what what is happening in the 40 space time. The 40 space time just has a region where space smoothly end. And then in that region, there is some interesting structure sitting there, which is characterized by the extra dimensions doing funny things. So I'll, I'll adapt that, that point of view for now because I have to give you more data to completely uh, fix this, 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 this information, right? So it's not enough to just construct the metric and tell you that I, I removed curvature singularity and horizon. There are going to be regularity conditions, which is going to fix what these things look like more precisely. Good. Thank you for the question. Good. So, so the 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 big deal to think about now here is is what is the regularity of of these metrics, and in particular, you have all of these mass parameters that are sitting here, right? For each rod, there is a length. That length you can associate a mass parameter to it. There is also another part of the data, which is that from the four D space time asymptotically. I have fixed the asymptotic radii of the, of the two circles, okay? So very, very far away, part of the asymptotic data of my system is the size of, the, of, of these circles. So the regularity conditions for this, it basically should relate these mass parameters with this asymptotic data that I have to give you in, in, in this system. Okay, so first, before we proceed, you can ask in the four dimensional space time, what is the mass of this object? What are the charges that you observe? So this you can completely compute. So the ADM mass that you would observe from the 4D space by reducing on the torus is going to be given in some, by this awful, awful function, but it's, a, it's an awful function that you know all the pieces, right? So the, you, you sum over the mass parameters in a specific way, so the summing over even and odd is just distinguishing between the two different bub bubbles. And then you have some decoration that has to do with the magnetic field associated at e for each rod, right? Which is this B2 and B1 data. You can also compute the magnetic fields. So, so here, again, since I'm computing the masses and the charges in 4D, the natural coupling that appears is the 4D Newton constant. So G4 is the 4D Newton constant. And then you have the charges, you can also compute explicitly and you can write them in terms of the mass parameters, right? So once you determine all the mass parameters from, by solving the regularity conditions, then all, everything about the system is determined and all of the asymptotic data is going to be fixed. So there's only, you only have a U1 Ma Maxwell field, right? So there's only one magnetic charge. The, there's two. two there is a, there's a fiber. There's a there's a one external U1, and there is a there is there is a fiber in the basement. Oh, there's a Kaluza Klein U1. That's right. Oh, okay. So, so there's the Kaluza Klein Maxwell. There's a Kaluza Klein U1 gauge field and the ordinary Maxwell gauge field. That's right. That's why you have two charges. That's right. And your mass doesn't is not manifestly positive. Oh, it is. It is positive. You can check. In any solution that we construct, it will be positive at the end of the day. That's not obvious because the cop is not. Uh, yeah, it, it, I agree. It is, it is not obvious. But by the time you find the solution that can solve the regularity condition, you find positive solution. That's the secret to the all. Good, good observation. OK. Good. So, 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 so with that said, we, we, we move forward. So what do regularity conditions look like? So this is now the, where the rest of the problem comes. And this is quote unquote, I mean, so far we figured out how to solve the nonlinear equations. We've built something, we've removed curvature singularities, we've removed all sorts of horizon. We have things that look like topological cycles sitting at some local space and, and do, us, do what we want. We have to solve the regularity conditions. And these are, are going to be basically when you zoom in to each rod, the circles have to, have, to, have to contract in a smooth way. 
right? So that you have well-defined objects. So that so the metric is smooth and geodesically complete. Um, that's 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 one way of thinking. Of it. Another way to think of these regularity conditions is that when you have these rods, each one of them, as we said, have some assigned charge and some assigned mass, right? So they gravitate quite heavily and they really push on each other very hard. So another way to think of the regularity conditions is like the F equal to MA equations for this thing to be static, right? The regularity conditions from this point of view, you should think of them, they're the algebraic conditions to have a F sum of forces equal to zero at each rod. So at each rod, you will have this L function, it will receive a contribution from all other rods, right? So for each rod, there is a given L and it receives receive a contribution from all other rods. And in order for this system to be regular, for example, rods that correspond where Y1 circle collapses, oops, have to be these functions, these, these functions have to be fixed with respect to the, to the radius of that circle. Similarly, the rod from the odd side, so those functions have to be also fixed in this way, okay? So if you try to study these equations, they are quite nasty, actually. In general, there are going to be ratio of polynomials, which, which, are, which are polynomials of degree, in some cases, higher than n. These are highly non-trivial objects to, the, the, that you want to play with. So of course, you can solve it explicitly for small n, and, 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 and try to be happy. But then when you solve it for small n, you find that these things, they gravitate so strongly that no matter what you do, when you try to solve it for n equal to one, n equal to two, n equal to three, that the size of the whole structure is always going to be smaller than some geometric average of the radii, right? So you make some, you make very compact, very small objects in, uh, 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 here, but of course, we want to claim something like topological star, so we want to be able to make something that could be big, that can that can sort of scale on its own uh, with respect to n. Okay, so so to do this, we we then decided to study what this what these equations do look like at the large n and try to solve it in the large n limit. Okay, so this refers to what we will call a bubble bag n space time, and it will be clear why we picked that name. Okay, so in the large n limit of these rods, we can make a simplifying assumption. First, we will, for the sake of, of the problem, we will take the asymptotic uh, sizes of the circles to be the same. We call it Ry. And then in the large n limit, for, for the most part, the middle rods are going to stabilize the same size. Okay, there'll be fringe effects for the outside rods, but the middle rods are going to stabilize for the most part on the same size, which we will call M. Okay, so this is an assumption that you can start with, and then you can plug it into, into the equations and ask whether the solution exists. And luckily, this assumption works, and you can you can you can you can we can explicitly check that we can construct a solution. And in the solution that you can construct, you find that the at the end of the day, the 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 size of the individual rods are going to stabilize to something that scales at n to the minus three half. So the more bubbles you have, the more it gets squeezed, the smaller it will it, it will get. This n to the three half is great because it, 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 it's a power where by the time you multiply by n, summing over all rods, the ADM mass of this setup will scale at n to the one fourth times Ry. This is of course a very mediocre large n scaling, but it is better than scaling with just Ry, right? Which means that we could make this thing big, although we, it has to be big very, very, very slowly, but we can make it big. Similarly, the charges are also going to scale at one quarter. Okay. One question. Why do, you, can, yeah, why do you want to make it big? Oh, good. So why do I want to make it big? Because my motivation for this is to understand uh, a macroscopic solitonic object in GR. Okay. You can also, I mean, already, even the microscopic ones are interesting because these are going to are new objects which could only have their meaning 
as coherent states of gravity, even if they are very compact, right? So we can, so if you, if you take the small one, which just scale as the side of the extra dimension, if the extra dimension is large, you have very massive particles that are sitting there, right? And, and, and the size of each one of these is always going to be less than twice the, their short chill radius. So they're very, very compact, right? So in a sense, from that point of view, these are new uh, uh, non-supersymmetric uh, uh, solitons that can exist in GR, if, which are particle-like that are very, very compact and could be arbitrarily small. So what should you worry about about being arbitrarily small, okay? The thing you should worry about is, is certainly, if we want to think about this in a framework of string theory, you have these circles that are collapsing near these regions. So you could ask how small do the other circles get, okay? So you don't want the other circle to, 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 to be as small as the Planck scale or even the string scale, because by then you're far from being able to trust anything that you're saying here. So what that does is actually gives you an upper bound of n of how many rods that you can do because the more n you have, the more it gets squeezed. And actually, in for example, you can ask how this circle, what is the size of the y1 circle in the region where y2 uh, sits? The size of these is going to scale as n to the minus a one half, right? It scales as n to the minus one half. So the size of these things, even when they're not shrinking, are are very small. Near, 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 near these bubbles. So, so that 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 gives you actually an upper bound for n, which we can just dis, dis, discuss uh, 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 afterwards, uh, if, if if you're in, if you're interested. But 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 the upshot is that this is the first sort of non susy construction of solitonic objects from which you can dial and make big and and try to play around with and try to study what they could look like. Uh, uh, in more realistic uh, 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 scenarios. Okay, so there is another piece of information I can tell you here, which is that as you might suspect, you can consider this rod, right? And then you can ask what is the proper length of this system? What is the proper size of this system in the metric? So if you compute the distance from north to south of how long this thing is, you can get this to that is scaled of n to the one half, so so it's long. Whereas if you go the east to west, which would be the the, the equator, that scales of n to the one quarter. So it really wants to be like this elongated thing that that's sitting there for the proper uh, when you try to compute the proper length. However, something rather dramatic happens if I ask what 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 does this metric, what does this object look like outside? So what does it look like outside? So, so, so if you try to study this metric outside, the, 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 the system that we have is highly non-trivial. You have these functions that are doing all sorts of wild things. It turns out if you, you can define a radius where you, where you study the, the space time at r greater than 2m plus one, where there is a correction of order one to the one half right, just a little bit outside the surface, right? So, so the surface at the equator is sitting at r equals to 2m, right? So you, you just study the metric in this region. Um, there is an effective mass parameter, which just sums over all the mi that scales us one quarter. The metric right outside looks like this. So this is the case where we turn off all the electromagnetic, all of the magnetic charges for simplicity. You can add them, they decorate the metric more, but the metric right outside the structure, by outside meaning one of, of order one over n squared, of order one over root n, the metric dramatically simplifies to this, to this rather thing. So this was incredibly surprising that if you just step a little bit away from this thing, the metric dramatically simplifies. And so this space time, this, 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 this metric here, it turns out the metric itself this, this, this thing right outside itself will solve Einstein's equation on its own. So you can push this into the Einstein's equation on its own and it actually solves Einstein's equation independent of knowing this came from this, this, this bubbling geometry. So outside, this just looks like a singular object. And from an outside observer, you don't see any deviation 
from this rather simple thing until you come at scale r equal to 2m. And when you come at scale r equal to 2m, this is when you see all of a sudden the space just opens up and have this long stringy object just sitting there. Okay. And this you can characterize more carefully. To characterize this more carefully, what, what, what one of the things we can do is just think about the 4D space time uh, and then think about concentric spheres that surround the structure from an outside. And then you can plot the area of these concentric spheres. So here in this plot, we, we show the area of these concentric spheres. Here we have two things. One, the orange is the area of these concentric spheres in the metric itself, in the full metric, which ends at r equals to m, which ends at the surface of, the of, of this bubble. And then the dotted one is, is the area of these concentric spheres in the approximated metric here, for example. So as you suspect, the orange one should end at some point, which is exactly where the size is, where you get the, the actual effective size of this thing. And the observation here is that these, these spheres, they are, they, they, from the 4D space, they get smaller and smaller, as you might expect, as, 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 as going at 4 pi, r, 4 pi r squared. But then when you come close enough, the, these spheres actually become big. They get big again. And they get big again, where you then enter the region where this structure is, and then you have this long structure then sitting there. From the outside, you couldn't tell that you had this long structure sitting there. Ivo, so here I'm we- lost. Ivo, I'm lost. So um, is there a missing d phi squared here from the axial symmetry or? So this I mean, is- uh, I don't even see six coordinate, let's see. Um, good, 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 good. So I'm suppressing the, the, the circle coordinates, right? So here I'm computing the area d phi d theta at a fixed r. If I include the extra circle coordinate, this sort of opening up doesn't happen. And there's and many why, re reasons why oh, to expect that. Okay, and y1 and y2 are circle coordinates. Yeah. So if I include the circle coordinate, this doesn't happen. And the reason why it doesn't happen is because we know from entanglement entropy arguments why minimal surfaces in, in a space time either have to be behind horizons or on horizons themselves, right? So if I were to compute the quote unquote minimal surface in the full space time, I would not see it. And indeed you don't, right? If you consider this circle and you also keep track of the Y1, Y2, then you don't see this, 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 this feature happening. But if I just focus on the 4D space time, this is one way to sort of characterize the spaces where, where basically from the point of view of the 40 space time, the, these concentric circles get small and then all of a sudden get very big and then end at this nice structure. So this is why we call them bubble bag ends. Um, so in these plots, also we highlight something else that so this is n equal to 20. So here, we, we, the, the dotted line is the approximated space time and the, perp and the yellow line is the full space time the, that we compute you can see that they, they, they match quite well at an arbitrary distance close to the structure, right? So this is like one, R over two M is how, measures how far you are. So R equal to two M is where the structure is sitting. So R over two M measures how far, and you can see that you have to get very, very close to start to see the, the, uh, this metric to deviate from the complicated uh, space time that we, that we computed. Okay, so the picture you have, we have in mind is basically this. So you have this asymptotic R3 times T2. We, let's just think about the R13, let's forget about the T2. And then you come into the space time, at some point it just suddenly opens up and there is this complicated structure decorated by collapsing T2 on it that's just sitting there. And you wouldn't know until you write on it from the point of view of the space time. So for this reason, we call it a bubble bag end. This, this sort of hobbit nerdy picture of what that looks like. Go ahead, David. So are you saying Tolkien had this solution? Yes, Tolkien had this solution. That's what he had in mind when he was writing that. <laughs> okay, so this is very cool. So then what else could I tell you? So there's many different aspects of this geometry that we can study. 
One of the other things that we observed that, that is worth reporting on. So I mentioned that there is this metric right outside the structure, which itself solves Einstein's equation. It turns out there is a huge family of these metrics that solve Einstein's equation that are singular. So you can think of them roughly as going back to the source, but instead of sort of cleanly delineating um, the between the two circles, I become a bit myopic and sort of smear. So when you do this, you can get a solution here. So here I've turned back all of the charges and everything is back on. You get a solution which is characterized by two numbers. So a priori, this is a solution of Einstein's equation, which is characterized by an M and a D. So D is appearing as this power and D is roughly telling you how much of this mirroring is due to the Y1 circle shrinking or the Y2 circle shrinking. And it turns out for all of these classes of metrics, you can show that when you approach, um, when you approach the singularity, so this is a time, this is a space-like singularity. When you approach a singularity, you can replace the singularity as this bubbly geometry that we just described, right? So, so another thing that we sort of discovered along the line, we discovered a huge family of desingularizing thing, of desingularizing uh, 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 geometries for 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 T space time. Although these are space-like singularities, they're not time-like singularities, not like a Big Bang singularity, but these are singularities which for all purposes, they would be there. But when you become very, very close, you can replace the singularity with, with, with these bubbly, bubbly geometries. And this was rather surprising. Uh, and it sort of uh, raises quite a bit of questions of how we should think about singularities that we get in GR. Uh, uh, uh. And also, for, to the best of our knowledge, I'll be happy to be corrected. This is the first time where there's an explicit resolution of a curvature singularity in the part from BPS sector uh, uh, in, in, in gravity, if someone thinks they have another example. I mean, there is, of course, the famous Gibbons Hawking desingularizing of orbitals, but here, this is even worse. This is the curvature singularity that we claim is completely desingularized by this bubble geometry. Uh, I'd be happy to hear if anyone knows of another example or something like this happens. Okay, I think my time is up, so I'll end now. Uh, so hopefully I've uh, discussed some interesting new class of solutions which do many fun things that we would want a quantum theory of gravity to do for us, but we do it in a sort of this halfway in between of, of being fully quantum mechanical to being fully classical because after all, these topological structures, the only way they make sense in their formation is from some quantum theory uh, 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 setup. There are many questions to ask uh, and to play with uh, from here. For one, this structure that we have, I've just considered two circles. You can easily imagine if you have N circles, each circle is gonna give you an additional species of a rod that you can put in this thing. So you can study a huge family of them. We can embed all of these structures within string theory and M theory. So even there, we can have many interesting things to discuss and we can fit them in the more standard brainy language. So there is some work, work ongoing work with Pierre where we're trying to sort throughout where does this sit within string theory and M theory and what can we describe there. And, and so when we started doing this, we didn't expect to, to find much, but we did. So it sort of really raises the question that, you know, maybe there are many things around the corner that, that if we look for them, we will find them. And then that means then we should look for them and, and, and try to understand what they are. Another sort of immediate thing you might want to ask, want to do. So if you look at in any of these intersections between two rods, in the region near this metric, you get an R4 piece from the regularity. Such an R4 can be replaced with an R4 mod VK, and this will introduce an orbital singularity there. And that orbital singularity is resolvable by Gibbons Hawking center. In fact, we can do this completely in all of these construction. Between all of these junctions, we can replace it with an R4 mod VK, and then we can claim that we can resolve that with much smaller bubbles, which are given talking bubbles. And when you do this, this structure can even grow even bigger when you add those. 
But of course, the big caveat of that is can you then take those small Gibbons Hawking bubbles and then blow them up and then make them big and, and, and see what they do? That's going to go beyond the actually symmetric setup. So we have no idea how to do that. And that would be very fun to think about that with anyone. You can ask more broadly, why do these things exist, right? So did we, were we just incredibly lucky to, to, to see this? But famously in GR, there is no luck. Either things work or they don't. And if things work, there's a reason for it, okay? And, and the reason why those, those solutions exist, I suspect, is because there is some integrable structure in GR. And this integrable structure is known in many other contexts that's called inverse scattering method. And there are various sort of background transformations that exist for GR equations. Uh, uh, and to some degree, we can map our setup to setups where we know these inverse scattering methods are there and these background transformation exists. So it would be very nice to understand this more general integrable structure that's allowing us to build this, not for the sake of understanding, but also allowing us to build much more interesting and much more complicated set of things. Since I had the initial motivation about gravitational waves, you can ask questions about physical observables in the sky, right? This is something we're playing with. You can ask, you can do even more cookie, more crazy things like phenomenologically realization of these things. For one, for example, as Greg pointed out, it's very easy to make small versions of this, but all small versions of these things are super heavy, are really, really heavy, right? So, so, so. The, the, because why are they heavy? Because anything that you make, it has a size very close to its short shield radius. So you could ask, is there a realization where you could make many of these small topological objects early on in the universe and could they survive long and what do they do? So that crazy idea is worth playing, for, playing with because we have nothing else better to do. Um, and then there's questions about stability uh, which is related to the existence of these things, which I did not have time to discuss, but uh, we have some ongoing work with an India day who's been exploring uh, those questions uh, uh, more, more, more seriously. So I'll stop here and thank you. <clears throat> Let's, uh, thank you, Boo, for a very nice talk. And uh, let's go into uh, Q and A. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and I'll uh, I'll call on you. If there are any questions, I see um, uh, uh, Greg has a hand up. Actually, that was an applause, but I do have a question. Okay, <laughs> oh, <please. Is> it? <laughs> people often make that mistake. Um, yeah. Um, so. Ibu, can you make, can I use these to make near BPS solutions in string theory or? Yes, we think we can. I don't want to say yes. We think we can, we think we have them, uh, but these okay. things. So I, I was wondering about the quantum realization. I mean, do you have families of solutions? Are these families in any sense parameterized by a phase space that I could quantize and get the states? No, I don't know what the phase space look like. Uh, what the phase space uh, would look like. So, so if I another question you can ask when you construct this rigid structure, are there any specific moduli that you can think about? Right. So it's it's, it's very very rigid. So so far we can't see this other than the asymptotic charges. The only other thing that you might have you can might have because you have these really high order polynomials, you can have various disconnected classes of solutions. I see. But they're discrete, which would be discreetly labeled. And that shouldn't okay. be surprising, of course, from a non BPS perspective. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd like to remind you of this um, entropy enigma that uh -huh. uh, yeah. Frederick Deneff and I talked about. So, you know, basically, we said that there was a counterexample to OSV. So the BPS, you know, the entropy of BPS black holes as a function of the charge doesn't grow like E. It, like Q squared, but like Q cubed. Mm -hmm. The interpretation we gave to that was that, um, well, um, probably some some instanton effects will raise a Q, roughly speaking, order Q cubed or e to the Q cubed uh, yeah. solutions. So there should be like this huge, huge. Um, 
spectrum, a uh, very dense spectrum of near BPS black holes, right just above the uh, BPS black holes. Hmm. Yeah, so this, yeah. We, we, we might be able to look for this, but, 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 but I don't want to say yes or no. This is a very interesting thing to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah we think, because we think we can, we can embed this in, 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 in this, this sort of a solution, we can find them in type 2B, and then uh, we can find solution with these interesting bubbles, and then you can, take, you can try to take some DPS limits where you would get actually like a black hole. Right, and then you turn on to BPS parameter a little bit off the black hole, and then you get back to this, to this, to, to this, to this sort of a construction. So this might be a place where we can try to look for this, but I don't want to make promises yet. Okay. Uh, Thank Tudor you. Has, uh, Tudor has a question. Uh, yeah, just a, a simple one. Um, do you need the second uh, effective Maxwell field? Um, or could you do? Uh, could you generate some interesting topology? Topology just with a single circle. Good. So good. Good question. So you could ask. You can even ask that more brutally. Do I need these Maxwell fields at all? And indeed, you can turn them on, and you can turn them off, turn them off, and then when you turn them off, you do get these, these bubbly solutions. But we don't expect them certainly to be stable in any sense. For example, I can take the single bubble solution, just a single rod. So in the single rod, that's just actually a 5D solution. I don't need to worry about the fixed direction. And that is going to be spherically symmetric. So if you take the single rod, and then you go to the limit where the charge is zero, that gives you the witness bubble of nothing space time. And that we know is not stable in any sense. But then you can, you can turn on the charge uh, for this. Uh, and, and India computed what happens to the free energy of the system when you turn on the charge. And as soon as you do, you get two stable, two, 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 two saddle points. One of them is metastable, and the other is just the continuation of the Witten bubble of nothing, which is, which is unstable, okay? So this is why we need the charge. So if we expect anything to be stable, we need, we need to be able to turn on these charges, and then we can get these new metastable back to us uh, metastable, metastable state that would correspond to, 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 to these things. How much charge do you need to do that? I don't know. And this is going to depend from system to system that you study. Thanks. Yeah. So I have a uh, question is that you encouraged uh, questions at the end about instability. Uh, wondering if you had any beyond what you just said, did you have anything more you would have liked to have elaborated on? I, 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 the the only thing that I would do is get off here and show you a plot that sh that, do, that show that. <laughs> okay. but, but 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 I think, but but I guess you know showing a plot makes it more believable than saying it in words. Okay. Yeah, but 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 yeah. So 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 studying the way you have to study stability is in this way, and this is a, a sort of a framework that in India developed, which is that. What you, what you have to do if you take the, this system, you have to impose the boundary conditions that corresponds to having the trust because that's, that's, that's some fixed data. And then when you impose those boundary conditions, the only other thing that you have to make sure you can have, you, you have to make sure this is a, this satisfies, uh, this is a well-defined Hamiltonian system. So you have to solve the Hamiltonian constraints in, the, in GR. So once you solve the Hamiltonian constraint in GR, then you can compute a quote unquote off shell uh, uh, action for these things. And then you can look for saddle points for such an action. So in the case of a spherically symmetric solutions, this is easy to do and we have, and that's the one that I would describe. The one thing that is harder is how do you do it for these non, uh, non spherically symmetric, even for these actually symmetric things, in some cases, you can, so you can solve explicitly the, 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 the Hamiltonian constraint but you get many, many different sort of possible initial data that you can give this system. And what those initial data roughly corresponds to is the number of different directions from which you can sort of destabilize such a system. Right? It's a number of different directions this thing can flow from. So in order to give a more precise answer, you need to characterize that first. And you have to understand what that looks like, right? So that's, this is something we're studying and then 
you know, hopefully we will get a control of that, but, but that is a completely different beast on its own uh, 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 that, that we're playing with. But if we do, then we could ans answer very precisely in what sense are these things uh, uh, metastable and in, in what sense they exist. Thank you. Are there any other questions? If not, let's uh, thank Ibu again. Thank you very much. And, and our, our next uh, talk, and this uh, will be on, in, on November 8th, uh, uh, Tony Pantep will be speaking. So, so hope to see you then. Okay. Okay. Okay, so now I can hear it. Now you can what? Now I can hear all the yelling. Oh, the uh, <laughs> <because they're, laughs> Usually you oh. get yelled at 